In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In his continuing narrative of our Lord's journey toward Jerusalem, and therefore the Christian's disciples' journey of faith with Jesus, once again, St. Luke tells us of a parable Jesus told and supplies the point by describing the problem addressed, namely that of some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Now don't worry about another parable. It's not about the tax collector is driving a cart into a ditch and the Pharisee promising somehow to get it out of the ditch. It is more interesting that this parable is so important and memorable and pivotal and yet it appears only here in Luke's Gospel. For this parable treats most directly the central teaching of the entire Bible and of the Christian faith, namely, the justification of, or salvation, of the sinner by God's grace through faith in Christ alone for the sake of his bloody, holy sacrifice on the cross and mighty resurrection from the dead. After telling the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector, Jesus concludes how only one of them went home justified. I love that word, justified. It's one of the most important words of the gospel. And I was kind of looking at the rather unique translation of Luke and Acts by Clarence Jordan in his cotton patch version of Luke and Acts to see how he translated, because this is a translation of the word, translated the word justified. He calls the Pharisee the church member and the tax collector the unsaved man. But while we might disagree with that, he has Jesus say, referring to the tax collector, I'm telling you, this man went home cleaned up rather than the other. Cleaned up. To be justified, he says, means to be cleaned up. Cleaned up of sin and of God's judgment of death against sin. Now you, I presume, got cleaned up to come to church this morning. Mother tells her children to come in and get cleaned up before dinner. When we're going to have people over to our house, we generally make sure that we clean up the living room, the kitchen, and the other rooms, or at least the ones that they might see. To be saved from sin, death, and hell means to be cleaned up spiritually. The only thing is that sin has stained us so thoroughly and deeply that no one can get rid of sin on their own. Now, if you just try to cover up your sin, pretend it's not there, you'll be like those who Jesus, of who Jesus said, trusted in themselves that they were righteous. It was a phony, fake, pretend righteousness. Because, of course, the Bible says unequivocally of every human being, there is none righteous. No, not one. So, Jesus told this parable of two men who went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, Jesus has already had some words of warning for the Pharisees who were standing around there and listening in. And tax collectors, of course, were commonly despised. Did you notice in the Pharisee's prayer, he refers to himself nine, five times. I thank you that I am not like others. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. 
Now that might sound pretty strange until you remember that this is the default setting, if you will, of the fallen sinful nature. That is to look to yourself and your works to get right or cleaned up before God. The Pharisee is the epitome, the poster boy of all who trust in themselves and dare to pretend even right before God that they are so much better or moral than anyone else. The tax collector, on the other hand, is the picture here of humble repentance, saying only the prayer of confession, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Actually, the Greek has a definite article making him call himself the sinner. And that might remind you of the Apostle Paul's great uh, confession in 1 Timothy. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Or as we used to say, of whom I am chief. And so we sing, chief of sinners, though I be. We take up that same confession on our lips. Now the first requirement to become a Christian then, and a member of the church, is that you must be a sinner. A fact that kind of surprises some people who have other ideas of what's going on here. Only those who know and believe that their salvation, their justification, has to come from God alone, from outside of ourselves, can dare boldly to confess their sin. You need to know that there is something very unique about the particular wording of the tax collector's prayer. Almost all translations have him say, God, be merciful to me. And yet this is not the usual word for mercy. As in the liturgy, Lord, have mercy. What is it there? Kyrie eleison. The tax collector says rather, helasthetai, meaning to be reconciled or propitious through sacrifice. It's the word that's used in the Septuagint to translate the Hebrew kippur as a yom kippur, the day of atonement. And so the tax collector's prayer is much more in line with God's revealed way, Old Testament and New, of salvation through an atonement for sin than through any presumed self-righteousness. All Old Testament sacrifices, of course, pointed forward to the one and only perfect and worthy sacrifice of God's Son whose blood <coughs> paid the price or redeemed the world, Old and New Testament alike, from sin and death opening again the kingdom of God to all believers, to all who do not refuse or reject God's gift of forgiveness. So Jesus concludes, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. For instance, who? Who would be the best picture of how we are to humble ourselves? Notice what follows. The great reversal. They were bringing infants, babies, to him to have him touch them. <coughs> and therefore, Luke did, includes not a change of subject here, but an illustration when people were bringing even infants and babies to Jesus. The disciples rebuked them. <coughs> I'm sorry, Jesus uh, doesn't have time for that right now illustrating that they hadn't yet gotten the point of the parable. What point? That justification, salvation, even saving faith itself is not ever the product of anything in you. It is total, complete gift from God. So Jesus says, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. 
For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. And how does a child receive the kingdom? How does a child receive anything? You notice, haven't you, how infants, when they become at least a little aware of their surroundings, learn quickly to grab whatever the object is and stick them in their mouths. Babies don't do anything to receive what they need. Mom and dad give them what they need. Well, so does God. But not just to infants alone, but to any and all who will simply let, simply allow God to give us what we need according to his good and gracious and merciful will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh yeah, that means we have to believe in him. Well, what's that? God so loves the world that he even gives the gift of faith to enable us to believe in his son and receive eternal life. It's total gift. You see, Jesus loved and reached out not only to the tax collectors, but even to us Pharisees and all who are blinded by their sin, trying to clean themselves up and thus refusing the cleansing of the blood of Jesus by faith. We get cleaned up when we let God do the cleaning, the reconciling, the atoning through the all-availing sacrifice of Jesus Christ crucified. Those who so trust in Christ, God declares justified, righteous, all cleaned up. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.